homework one. So I mean, actually the second homework, but it's titled homework one. <coughs> this is also on WeLearn, so the official students already have access to this. Okay. <coughs> so, yeah, so this is essentially going to be uh, the last uh, the last class on Himalayan uh, on the section on Himalayan manifolds, and then we'll start with geodesics. <coughs> so let me remind you where we were at last time. So we're talking about examples of Himalayan manifolds. So the setting was so M is a smooth manifold and G is what's called a Himalayan manifold. <coughs> this means so M. Map. 
<coughs> and this is a well-defined map simply because of this being defined as for every point P, this is an inner product on PPM. So it induces the inner product on PPM. The only thing that you have to check is that this is true. <coughs> so where you use the fact that the topology of N on its own it agrees with the induced topology of N. <coughs> so, uh, yeah, so basically, the, so this is just a very general fact. So it says that whenever you have a submanifold of a manifold which has a metric, this metric induces a metric of the submanifold, which is this. Okay. So here you have. <coughs> the only thing that you have to find is the following that if you are given a metric here, the distance between two points on M is what? It's basically you look at all piecewise smooth curves, you look at the length calculated using G, and then you take the integral. So if you take two points which are in N itself, then the length computed in this metric will not agree with the length computed here. Simply because to compute the length for two points here, you have to choose a path in N. And minimize over that. But the minimizer here might be over, over a larger class of paths. And that is precisely what happens even for the sphere. And if I take two points, say the north pole and the south pole, the Euclidean distance is 2 0, 0, 1 to 0, 0, minus 1. But the, but the actual distance induced from R3 to S2 is going to be half of a great circle. Because if you use any of the half longitudes, you go from the north pole to the south pole. And that is pi. Because it's half of the circumference, and the circumference is 2 pi. <coughs> so, this is not going to be the same. So, another way of saying this is things which look like geodesics here will no longer even make sense here simply because there are curves here which do not play here. <coughs> but this is still a metric. I mean, this, uh, okay. so this is still a Riemannian metric. So, we induce a topology by taking the D associated with this. Okay. <coughs> okay, so this is true in general. So, given a G, this induces this. So this is how we should think of this. So if you think of D Euclidean, and this is the usual <coughs> Euclidean metric, Euclidean metric meaning both the usual metric as well as the Riemannian metric. Okay. <coughs> Why? Because <coughs> so let, let me put it this way: Riemannian metric. <coughs> What is the, the I am plus one, let's say. Okay? What is the usual included Euclidean uh, Riemannian metric on Rn plus one? In this language, this is going to say that for every point in Rn, you have to assign me a positive definite symmetric matrix of rank n plus one. But you are going to assign the identity matrix. That's exactly what the usual Euclidean inner product does. Right? So given a point, if I take two vectors at that point, the inner product is the standard inner product. So it's just the cause. So this. This corresponds to this D Euclidean. This corresponds to the map sending R n with the identity n plus n plus n plus this thing. Okay? I mean, this corresponds to this particular map in, in this language. Okay? <coughs> but you could have chosen a continuously or smoothly varying thing here, and then the metric would change. <coughs> okay. Anyway, so if you take that, then you get this thing, which uh, I'm just. So I just put a field there here. So this is really that metric which agrees with the usual metric that I've seen in points of topology, but restricted to the sphere. And so this is called a round sphere. Okay? Simply because this agrees with the usual aggregate Euclidean geometry, and this is indeed the round sphere, the boundary of the Euclidean ball. Okay, so uh, so here of course you could you could of course modify this by keeping the same SS by simply choosing a different Riemannian metric on Rn plus 1, which would amount to changing this function to something else. And then if you restrict, you are going to get a different metric on the same sphere. Okay. So, so, for instance, if you imagine that the metric on an S2 basically is almost, so we have seen metrics on S2 in curves and surfaces. It has constant Gaussian curvature 1, the standard metric. Right? Or if you take a sphere of radius r with the same thing, you have curvature 1 over r squared. Okay. So, you can integrate that. <coughs> so, but you could always imagine that the, your sphere sort of has small bumps. Okay, so this is probably, this is just a sort of picture, right? <coughs> so, anyway, so this is not the standard 
sphere in arc C, but this is definitely homeomorphic to the standard sphere. So imagine you have a balloon and then on the inside you are sort of poking your fingers and feeling small vents pointing outwards. So if you think of this, which is as a, as a surface, homeomorphic or even diffeomorphic phase 2, and you look at the standard metric on arc C and look at what it induces here, this is not going to be the same as the usual S2. Why? Because the curvatures here are going to be much bigger than 1. Okay. So there are some curvature concentrations here, and there will be certain points where the curvature is 0. And these places, the curvature looks like 1. Okay. So the point is, you cannot have curvature more than 1 everywhere, simply because the integral of the curvature of this object is going to be 2 pi into the order tactics. So that's cos 1 and zero. It has to be 4 pi. So if you're creating extra curvature here in the positive direction, which you are by creating these small like pop marks or bumps, it has to compensate for some negative curvature somewhere. The integral has to be still 4 pi. In the usual sphere case, the curvature is 1, so if you integrate over the standard round sphere of diameter 1, of radius 1, it's just uh, 4 pi r squared. So that's 2 pi into 2, because r is 1. Otherwise, the curvature is 1 over r squared. When you integrate over the surface, it's 1 over r squared to 4 pi r squared. That's still 4 pi. So this is all cos minus zero. So, so we'll come back to this example later on. So this is one way of creating a sphere, but the metric is not this. <coughs> so this is a very, uh, very, very special metric. It has a lot of symmetries. Okay, three. <coughs> so this is typically part of a family of. <coughs> so in this particular example gives you a metric where the curvature is actually always constant positive plus one, let's say. This one, for the usual example, will give you zero. If you choose a different thing, you'll get a different sort of curvature. So the standard example, this will tell you that this is what's called flat. <coughs> so let's do the other example. This is H, you can do HS, but I'll just do H. <coughs> this is also a space that you've encountered in terms of curvature. This is the only thing remaining in the list where you have a space which has a metric, but then when you calculate the Gaussian curvature, it turns out to be constant negative minus one. <coughs> so a model for this, so there are two, two typical models. So one model is <coughs> so here of course when I draw this, this is slightly misleading because what I really mean is this is the upper half plane, but the open upper half plane. So the x-axis is not there. <coughs> so this is my model for h. This is open. So this is open. Upper. <coughs> the other model that you might have also seen along with this is what's called the Poincaré unit disk model. So it will be a unit disk without the boundary. So the metric is not that of the standard unit disk. Let's stick to this one. So here I want to put a metric, a Riemannian metric on this space. So what would be a Riemannian metric here? Well, this as a manifold, it can be covered by its own chart. Right? You just take the upper half plane, that's an open subject of R2, the identity map with its own chart. So just by the usual thing, whenever you have a chart, the tangent space of a chart is the chart cross on it. So the same thing will happen here. So a metric here I want to specify for every point. A positive definite symmetric e cross two matrix. <coughs> right? This is the same thing because this formalism works even for a chart because for a chart P of U is U cross R. So what I have to do to give a metric for every point x comma y, I have to specify a two cross two positive definite symmetric matrix, and I do that by saying that G at the point x y is defined to be. I think there is uh, maybe a plus sign. I'll put one more one here. Okay. So this is what I'll define. It's clearly symmetric because it's diagonal. And it's positive definite because the entries are positive, and this makes sense because y is never zero. In fact, y is positive, right? So this defines a remaining metric. Up to scaling by 
Okay, so <coughs> so why is this anything special? Well, this is important. Well, for several reasons because this is the first model of a space where you have a metric so that when you calculate the Gaussian curvature it turns out to be a constant negative uh, one. Okay. <coughs> but in particular what this tells you is that if you were to calculate the length of a curve going from here to here, in the Euclidean setting you could have done it in finite time because you simply have to take a straight line which goes from here to here that line will have finite length. If you calculate a similar curve here, what will happen? So let's say you have a curve from here to here, right? So this is not included, but let's say you are trying to go there. This is your gamma. Let's say this point is i, which is nothing but 0, 1. You want to calculate the length of this. So what is gamma of t? <coughs> so I want to start here and try to, my aim would be to try to go to the boundary if possible. So this, this is the, so and all of you have seen geodesics and things here, either in the courses or otherwise. So this is, it, it, it turned out that this is a geodesic for this metric. Okay. So the other sorts of geodesics are circles which are perpendicular to the extent. <coughs> so this is a picture you may or may not have seen, but if you haven't seen, you'll encounter that again formally. But you can take it to be just a straight line. So what should I write it? It's a straight line parametrizing a path joining I and going all the way if possible. So it starts at I and then it keeps going, right? <coughs> So i minus, uh, just to go that way, right? So let's say if you put 0 here, then 0, so this is just 1 minus t, right? <coughs> so at t equal to 0, this starts at i, and at t equal to 1, this will go there, but of course it lands outside of space. So if you want to calculate the length of, so this is defined, let's say, from 0, 1. So if you want to calculate the length of gamma, what do you do? Well, you can throw in the one, otherwise it will be 0 to 1 over n, uh, I mean 0 to 1 minus 1 over n and limit over n. That's how you calculate the length of such a thing. This is just gamma prime of t, gamma prime of t half. This is using this metric g, right? So again, in our notation, g is implicit, so this means you use this metric at the point down t. <coughs> Which is just 0, comma something. Right? So the x is anywhere doesn't appear in here, and the x doesn't appear in our path either. This is dt. Right? This, so what do we get? <coughs> so gamma prime t is going to be what? Gamma prime t is going to be uh, minus i t, right? So this implies this. So if you want, you can write it down in terms of x, y coordinates. Right? So this is going to be just uh, yeah, 1 minus t in the third coordinate. Right? So this is minus 1, right? In the xy coordinate, because this has a complex number, this is a real part. So this is 0, 1 minus t. Differentiate, you get 0, minus 1. And you're capturing the length of this. So the length of, the usual length of this for the usual Euclidean Riemannian metric is just 1. Because it's just a vector 0, minus 1, the length is 1, because it's not perfect. Here the length is not going to be that, it's going to be that scaled by 1 over y squared. Right? So what should I write here? So this should really be in the usual setting, in the usual Euclidean matrix setting, this would have been 1, right? If I take D Euclidean, this would have been 1. So this metric is not that it's scaled by this thing. So our y is remember 1 minus t, right? So this is going to be 1 over. So I have to take a square root, so, so this is dt. dt. Because the length, if this is the length square, right? So if I take, calculate this object, forget the half, that's going to be the usual <coughs> thing, right? So you'll we'll be taking 0 minus 1 times this matrix times 0 minus 1. That's how calculate the inner product of two vectors given this matrix. So that's going to boil down to the usual length divided by 1 over 1 minus t whole square. And then you have to take half of that, square root of that. So this is what you get, but this is clearly. Uh, this limit is not going to exist. It is going to be infinite. So the point is, it will take you, no matter how to parameterize, you can never go from here to here in finite time. And that's because as you go towards the boundary, the usual tangent vectors which are of length 1 are actually becoming really large in length. Because the length is becoming 1 over 1 minus t squared. And as t goes to 0, 1 minus t squared is very, really, so 
sort of small. So 1 over 1 minus 3 is very big. So these tangent vectors, which look like image vectors, are actually getting very, very big. So you cannot really them, at least up to that point. So this does not make sense. Or another way of saying it is that you cannot go from here to the boundary in finite. <coughs> If you, if you like the disk model, you can do the same thing in the disk, but there the point is the disk model is misleading because it looks like it's a finite closed bounded kind of thing, but it's not because the metric is what's capturing how far you are from the origin and you're always infinitely far away from the boundary, no matter how close it looks like in the future. Okay, okay. So, so this is the one particular example. Uh, we will come back to this again. <coughs> So sometimes I think this, so uh, uh, one sort of remark, this is more a notational remark, that sometimes in books they often write g i, which is g i <coughs> in this notation. Especially I think in uh, parts of differential geometry and definitely in physics, we use this notation. So this is the same thing as that. Why? Because when I say dx squared, this is not dx wedge dx because from differential geometry you know that dx wedge dx is zero. The one form wedge itself is zero by squeezing it. So what this really means is this is dx tensor dx. And this is dy tensor dy, so it's a symmetric tensor. When you switch, this is the same, and you're dividing by y squared. So how do you think of this? This is really this object. Okay? This is really what this means, so what this notation in shorthand means. And how do you treat this as a bilinear form? Well, to say that this is a bilinear form, what you have to do? You have to say how to evaluate the pairing of two tangent vectors. But for any point here, P, there is a basis for the tangent space, d by dx and d by dy, these are partials. If I take d by dx as my input vector on both slots, I will be hitting this with d by dx comma d by dx. But this acting on dy dx, dy dx is 0 because this is dy and this dy dx. And this acting on dy dx, comma dy dx is 1 divided by y squared. So that explains the appearance of the 1 1 term being 1 over y squared. If I take dy dx, dy dy, both will be 0 because one of the slot is equal to 0. So that says that these two are 0 and it's symmetric. It's symmetric because this is inherently symmetric. And similarly, if I take dy dy, dy dy, this will give me 1 for y squared, this is 0, so that explains this term. So that's the notational meaning. So we might see this appear in books, but this really means this, which effectively means this. You might see other things using r theta coordinates, in polar coordinates, but they also mean the same thing. So, so I mean, and this explains this because there should be no confusion between this being a form. This is actually a symmetric two tensor. The form is usually a skew symmetric k tensor or a 1 tensor or whatever the rank is. So that's the only distinction, okay? Okay, uh, alright. Okay, so now let me go back to. So, with this example in mind, let's go back to how do you construct such things, okay? <coughs> so, all this is fine, but. How do you get rid of one such metric? And these examples tell us that on Rn there's plenty, you just choose one. And then you have to sort of put these together on Rn to all of n. The idea being that m local looks like Rn. So if you know how to construct a Riemannian metric on each of the UR paths, you somehow have to combine them all together to create a metric on all of them. Okay? So what is the idea? So the idea is so first of all, I'll choose. So whenever I say metric here, I mean a Riemannian metric, okay? And I don't it's too much right. Metric, uh, let's say, G alpha on U alpha. So why can you do this? Well, remember we have this map capital P alpha, which is a map from T U alpha, T U alpha cross I, and we use this map to give T U alpha the topology coming from pulling back this map. And this has the product topology, right? This is a homeomorphism because we define the topology to be exactly that. Now, if I want to give a Riemannian metric here, then I'm also saying that I want for every p in u alpha, 
uh, inner product on TP U alpha cross TP U alpha. Right? But in this, on this side that amounts to saying that for every T U alpha, I want you to give me a positive definite symmetric matrix, and this assignment from U alpha to M naught should be smooth. Right? So, so a metric here, basically, so this G alpha is nothing but a map from U alpha to M naught. Each one of them is smooth, but the supports are in one part. 
because it's locally finite, the left hand side makes sense. Right hand side is a constant constant one. So now what we do is we want to extend this g alpha to all of them. And you can do it by simply saying that I multiply O alpha with G alpha. So what will happen? For every point, G alpha is going to be giving you a positive definite symmetric matrix. If you multiply by O alpha, it's going to be a scaling of this thing. So if O alpha is 0 for a point, then O alpha of P times G alpha of P could potentially become the zero matrix. But it's still symmetric, it might lose positive definition. Right? If you scale a matrix, a symmetric matrix is still symmetric. It might lose positive definition. Right? So you can use, you can think of one for G alpha. This is now sort of uh, an element of, uh, how do I say this? This is an element of Pm as M. Okay. This is because essentially, you only have to check it for U alpha and on the overlap also. It's basically zero upside down. It's and symmetric, it need not be positive value. Okay. The only thing is, okay, so the other thing which is obvious when I need to stay with it is, of course, it's a wall path and one negative function. Okay, because it's a function. So you're scaling by something non negative. So it's smooth, symmetric, the advantage is that this is defined everywhere. So now all I have to do is have to take the sum of these g alphas scaled by u alpha. Okay, so, so you should think of what this is. This is at a point P, this is rho alpha of P times the matrix G alpha of P. So this basically boils down to calculating this for U alpha, for which is simply the matrix is scaled by U alpha. So now we find the G P. And again, this is a smooth function. This is symmetric because it's a sum of symmetric. <coughs> And so the only thing that you have to check is that this is a positive definition. Right? So why is this positive definition? Well, if you choose a point P, there will be some rho alpha for which rho alpha of P is non-zero. Right? That's because summation rho alpha is 1. So it wouldn't be that there's a point P for which all rho alpha is 0 at that point. So the left hand side is 0, this is 1. So there is some rho alpha where the rho alpha of P is non-zero. And actually there's finitely many such rho alphas. They are all positive scalars. So this is 